Hey, hey, hey. Hey, how's it going? It's going. It's uh it's Monday. You know, always always good to celebrate Monday with containers from the couch, as I say. <laughs> No doubt. That's it's, what you uh, always say every time. I know. Every time I say it. I just every day I say it. You know, but. it's really funny because on Thursday, which is our Friday, it's always good to like look back and see that, man, we talked about a lot on containers from the couch. And then uh, we go through the weekend. And by the time Monday rolls around, I'm like, man, I'm really looking forward to seeing what we're going to talk about. This is yes. this is exciting all over again. So. It, it hasn't really worn does off. feel that way. Not yet. And I don't know if it ever will. As long as we keep churning out cool content, I think like I'm just going to be excited every like every, every weekend I'm going to be looking forward to the show, especially if Justin's on. Because <laughs> Justin just makes it so much more fun. No doubt. What is that behind you in your background, Justin? That that is the uh the SpaceX uh was it the Falcon Heavy uh launch from a little while ago. So because uh, we're we're celebrating a launch today, and uh, and so I thought, you know, we gotta have background for it. Absolutely. What are we That's launching? Okay. Uh, yeah, today Bottle Rockets OS uh, for Kubernetes went to G uh, GA, so it is generally available if you want to run Bottle Rocket in your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, you can do it now, and it's awesome. I mean, you could do it before as well. We showed it off, but uh, now it's actually, you know generally available for the public. It's not a, a beta anymore. You can kick the tires and, and really start putting some workloads on it. And then also today is a developer preview for Bottle Rocket with ECS, nice. uh, which was previously unannounced. And, and now is, uh, if you're a developer and you use ECS clusters, uh, you can try Bottle Rocket as well. There's there's a lot of cool stuff uh, that you can do on, on either container platform, you know, or the, the orchestrator of your choice, use the same OS. It's exactly. Great. That's so cool. And Bottle Rocket is something that, you know, like it's not our typical uh, AWS AMI that we that we ship. What's what's different about Bottle Rocket, um, you know, both from a management perspective and just how it's constructed perspective? Yeah, it's well, first of all, as a, from an AWS perspective, it's open source. Right? I mean, like the entire yeah. thing. Uh, which yeah. is great because it's open source on GitHub. Go make pull requests. There's instructions on building it yourself and and trying it out. You know, modifying things. Uh, but then also, uh, it's it's more of a minimal OS. I mean, there, there's been minimal OSs in the past with core OS and things uh, that tried to just you know we had the previous. Uh, containers on the couch about bottle rocket for more of the fundamentals on like how to manage it, why it's different, uh, how you would access things, how you would modify things uh, with the, with the two container uh, kind of interfaces that you can connect into one for API access and one for more of a lower level uh, system access that you can get access to the host OS, but really it's, it's meant to be secure by default uh, for a lot of way in a lot of ways. And, and just because there's no package manager and everything is containers, it really minimizes that, uh, just surface area of what can, you know, what's exposed and, and how, how many moving parts you have to manage to make it work for you. Exactly. Yeah. I think, I think bottle rocket is so awesome and the whole like open source perspective of it. Uh, one of the things that I messed up on last time we were talking about it, I think when I tweeted about it, I said, I called it AWS bottle rocket. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got corrected. Shame on me. Uh, because it, I knew the whole time it was open source, but you know what I didn't, what I didn't quite catch was that uh, yes, we we sort of put it out there, but we aren't even branding it as AWS or anything like that. So this is this is freely available for anyone to take and modify and try and run it maybe in your own environment or. Uh, adapt it for your own use case and that sort of thing. So it is, it is uh, awesome from that perspective. And then from the perspective of, like you mentioned security, the, the starting point uh, is, you know, security focused, security in mind. So um, you don't have to like, you know, with a lot of other uh, operating systems and AMIs, you start here and you figure out what do I have to strip away to, to make it more secure. And with Bottle Rocket, you don't really have to do that. You know, you're starting at like basically the lowest level uh, that you can get to and you have just enough 
to be able to launch your containers and have your orchestrator, uh, you know, launch containers for you. And that's amazing. That's yeah. such a strong position to start. And, and from. how you manage it is, is come a long way too, where it's no longer everything in Linux is a file. But for operating systems like Bottle Rocket, you you manage it with an API, and it's it's no longer this. Hey, I have all these hosts I have to manage, and I have to put files on disk places and and do all this stuff. It's no, these are APIs now. It's API driven. We have you know command line tooling that interfaces with the API to do the things we want in a declarative manner, and in all these things that we've built with more complex systems. Now we can apply those to the OS as well, including the management interface for how we do updates and how it's no longer, you know, these, these large, you don't have to necessarily build a, a large AMI up front and, and roll that out via, you know, obviously the pattern of immutable infrastructure is good, but taking that immutable infrastructure and, and kind of shrinking it to the, the partition where, yeah. hey, I, I, can I can switch partitions and I can do rollbacks and I can do things that I can do at the application layer higher yes. up with load balancers. I can do that at the OS layer as well. Yeah, because you might be perfectly fine and perfectly happy with the VM that you've been handed. And you don't necessarily feel like you need to change that out. But being able to just swap the operating system that's running inside that VM would be pretty amazing. So uh, just a quick, you know, write the update to the auxiliary partition and then flip a bit and reboot. And suddenly you're updated. I think that's that's really cool, too. Um, so what uh, do we have? I'm thinking what, before what we thinking? get started, I think we should say hi to some of our regulars. What do you think? Oh, them? yeah, 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 of course. And you know, by the way, some of them might actually be, are any of them watching on our new channels? Because we yes. do have a new channel. Yes. If you're watching from the AWS container, containers, containers <laughs> channel, I mix channel and containers, please uh, give us a shout out. Say hello. Honestly, um, we should have taken that name. I like I like the containers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. containers. How do you spell that one again? <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So containers yeah, we're running. Gotcha. We're now running the stream into two containers. Uh, or so, <laughs> see, I'm doing it too. Two channels. Uh, so twitch.tv TV slash AWS containers is going to be for all things container related coming from uh, the container services team. So you can definitely tune in there. You can uh, subscribe there and only get push notifications uh, to that channel. We also have a YouTube channel. I'm waiting to really start pushing it until we can get the custom name for it. Cause right now it's just, you know, blob underscore blob of, of random looking uh, text. But yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you prefer YouTube, you can watch us there as well. Uh, but yeah, Twitch is, is uh, we're still gonna go to slash AWS. That's still gonna, that's still gonna be a place where you can find us. But if you're, if you're wanting to sort of curate, uh, then definitely uh, AWS containers is the place to be. And, and so, so uh, <laughs> Justin, there is, there is a talk around, uh, by the way, another, another regular. So welcome back. Um, yes. Hey. And, and seriously, the way that, so if you didn't see it, uh, Justin had, had tweeted a, a little teaser for his prop and it was like a little brown piece of paper, paper bag cut out, but the bottom looked like he like was, I don't know, tripped or something while he was cutting and it was a little <laughs> jagged and it just really, it got to me. Like I cut I, I all my like paper that. with a chainsaw. I don't know what your uh -huh. problem is. So it's, <laughs> it's with his teeth. <laughs> no, just like a butcher knife, you know, just trying to see how it goes. But whatever, whatever, you know, your style, because again, the top was perfect. The both sides were perfect, but that I use the edges. I use the corner Ooh. of the. <laughs> totally. Anyways, it worked out. But just a quick, uh, I just want to, you know, quick hellos. Wari21, welcome back. Good evening. I forget where you're located, but obviously it's somewhere far from here. I think, wasn't it Germany? I want to say Germany. I'm okay. hoping I beat the delay in in uh, <laughs> so, that, yeah. so that he can just say I'm right. Hello. Yes. yes. Oh, Let Techie me. Stories is back too. See, we start talking about security and Techie Stories shows up. Amazing. Hey, hey. <laughs> so anyways, welcome everybody. Thanks for, for joining us back. Um, there was a question. If you want to maybe jump on this question, Justin, um, how does Bottle Rocket compare contrast with Flat Car? 
uh, or Fedora Core OS. That's that second capital or the first capital O on that Core OS is throwing me off. I was like, whoa, what is Core OS? Oh, <laughs> yeah. I got gotcha. you. <laughs> uh, <and>, Colorado. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Core OS and, and Fedora Core OS and Flatcar Linux uh, were great at container operating systems. They are still a little general purpose where they do. It's funny because like compared to a standard, you know, Red Hat or Debian, uh, they are stripped down a lot. There is no package manager and, and it is much more up to date typically than some of those other operating systems where you're going to get a, a really new system D, a really new kernel, uh, which is great for containers. If you're running old kernels and old system D and you're also trying to run containers in production, I'm sorry. Um, that, <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. I've done that. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, but CoreOS really did, you know, let's get bleeding edge on some of this stuff so that it, everything works as expected. Uh, and they are still minimal but they still have traditional methods of updating. They have partition swapping for updates, but configuration is still typically files on disk. And, and actually CoreOS has a really cool, and, and Fedora CoreOS um, has the, uh, what's the init system that comes before cloud init? I, I can't remember, Ignition uh, is what oh, yeah. it used to be called, which is really fascinating because if you are running bare metal and you need to configure a, a system, you need to partition the disk before it boots and you need to put down systemd files before systemd starts. And so they solved that problem by basically running a, a stage of configuration in initd, which is all in RAM. And so it's before we actually pivot our route to systemd on the disk, do some other stuff, which was super awesome. For, I was on bare metal at the time and I was like, I actually need to take decommission servers and re, you know, reformat this and, and set down system D units because if you do it during cloud in it and try to put down a bunch of files for system D, you have to reboot the box because you say, oh, yeah. system D, load these files. Oh, now you have to redo ordering and it has to do all this stuff. But if you can do it in the RAM uh, before system D starts, you get all those benefits of disks are formatted, files are in place all before the actual PID one starts on the host. And, and that's awesome because it saves you a lot of time, especially for those bare metal hosts that would take 10 to 15 minutes to reboot. <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, my my core OS on-prem uh, cluster that I had would provision in three minutes, uh, but it took an extra 18 minutes to reboot twice. Um, so, <laughs> so I was like, the actual core OS bits were done in three minutes and I just sit there. I was just like, well, it's going to take 20 minutes to, to re-provision because I have to do two reboots. And that's that's where it actually took a long time. So if you could save that time, uh, it was it was awesome. So uh, Bottle Rocket is, is a little bit different in that the configuration is API driven and, and there isn't, maybe there are files on disk behind the scenes, but you're not, the, the root file system is read only. So you're not getting those files written until you reboot. So configuration happens through the API and it, it might write files to disk. It'll change some sort of setting so that when you reboot, you can get those settings on, on the next reboot. Uh, so it really is more of a immutable OS as far as configuration goes as well. Uh, so you're going to do that stuff either through cloud init for things like uh, what cluster am I connecting to my message of the day? Uh, is the admin container started? That sort of stuff. Uh, but then everything else is going to be API driven on the host. That's a great answer. That was very good. So should we, uh, should we jump into the demo? I guess, what are you going to show us today? What are we going to see? So today I want to show uh, the, uh, Kubernetes operator for bottle rockets for updates, because I didn't get a chance to show that off last time. And I, I wanted just to help people understand why you would do it this way. What are the benefits, even what are the, the disadvantages of doing it this way, managing your host this way. Uh, and then also uh, hopefully we have some time to show off uh, the ECS developer preview. So we can spin up an ECS cluster with bottle rockets and, and connect our, our instances into ECS, which in, swaps out basically the, the kubelets and container D for Docker and the ECS agent. So it, it's it's just a swap on the uh, version of Bottle Rocket. And so we can say, hey, let's use this flavor and, and spin it up in ECS instead. Fantastic. So let's, uh, what do you say we just get into it? Let's sure, make yeah. this, let's make the magic happen. <laughs> so here's my, uh, I already sp spun up my um, EKS cluster. So I, I'm not waiting for that to kind of provision or anything. So I do have uh, just a three node cluster. Uh, it's, it's pretty simple as far as Thank you. what I have today. What happened? 
I, oh, see, I, I, was, I was trying to mess with the stuff and move it, and I couldn't. Uh, and uh, it's, like, it. it's like we're both, you know, grabbing at the steering wheel at the same time, and neither one of us are in the driver's seat. So <laughs> <laughs> it's terrible. <laughs> so the one thing I did have um, is these are all an older AMI image. So this is the the previous release of Bottle Rocket. Again, today with GA, it is 1.0. Uh, so we're gonna we're gonna basically use the operator to upgrade all of these instances to the 1.0, uh, and just for there's there's a walkthrough doc. Actually, I'll, I'll share that screen in just a second. But if I if I look at my actual EKS configuration, um, this is literally copy and pasted, except for I added this AMI ID for the old um, the old version of the AMI that I wanted. So I can make sure I get. Zero, not dot five, uh, zero, however you want to say it, uh, so that I, I can show you the operator. Um, but nice. let, me, let me swap over. The and there are some, while you're doing that, there's quite a few questions in here. Um, can Bottle Rocket, uh, or will it be able to run a custom runtime like Cryo? I know there's some Bottle Rocket devs uh, in, in chat today, so I, I hope they can help answer that. Oh, nice. I, I do know, like, between ECS and the the, Kubernetes, the EKS versions, uh, we do it does swap out the container runtime. So the Kubernetes one runs container D, and ECS runs Docker. So we provide images that do that. So I'm sure there are mechanisms and ways that you can, you know, swap out that runtime as well. And uh, it is because, open source. Right. Absolutely. Yeah, which kind of kind of lends itself to um, another question here from W Shari. Uh, is there any other environment other than ECS where I can uh, deploy Bottle Rocket? And you know, I mean, also EKS. ECS is de is Dev Preview. Uh, EKS is GA today. But uh, when it comes down to it, you you could definitely start experimenting with. Uh, deploying it in your own uh, data centers or in your own uh, other cloud providers, if if that's where you want to go, and you know, as long as what you're doing is uh, you know essentially deploying an agent that talks back to your orchestrator, then you're you're a very good bit down the road. Uh, you have you have almost everything that you need. There might be some questions around you know the container runtime or or things like that. But uh, you have a lot uh, already, so you should be able to. It's definitely worth yeah. experimenting. And on the repo, I know there is an issue to support uh, Raspberry Pis. So there's, you know, a lot of people want, can I run, you know, K3S or something locally to, to test this? Because it's, it's a lightweight, you know, OS. There's not a lot of services running. Uh, the way you manage it is, is sometimes tied to specific things in Amazon right now, such as uh, user data endpoint, metadata endpoints. So if you need to configure it, you need to have some way to configure it at that level. So running it in at your house might be, you know, you, you need to, we need to figure out some of those pieces on how you're going to configure it at boots and, and do some of these things. Uh, but it's definitely something that I know there's an issue on the on the repo right now and, and a lot of interest in in doing that uh, for and I and I have actually heard from uh, from someone who wishes to remain nameless that they are running it in their own environment outside of AWS already. So I want it's, names. <laughs> I'm I'm trying to coax them onto the show. <laughs> nice. Uh, there was one other question. I don't think we, I th uh, just commentary about what is the base OS layer or should we even bother with that? Well, first you probably shouldn't bother with that because the whole point of, of moving to a container operating system like this is well, not the whole point. But one of them is all, everything that you care about should be inside your containers and what's happening at the base OS is like super, super, super unimportant and, and diminished at that point. I'm gonna I'm gonna check live what uh, it actually says in OS info. Um, yes, I don't remember for sure. So uh, I'm pretty sure it says Bottle Rocket, but I don't know if it said any other. Uh, Probably program. says Linux. <laughs> uh, so let's see. So I'm going to copy this one. I have a key. <laughs> But how do we install all of our bloat? I like that. right, yeah. Because I've been <laughs> I've been there. Uh, put your bloat in containers, obviously. Uh, no, it, in all seriousness, though, like convert your bloat to daemon sets. If you have to, if you absolutely have to have it, then make it a daemon set. 
um, and and have it be deployed by your orchestrator. I wish there was a faster way to switch which screen, which window I'm sharing without sharing my whole screen. So uh, I just Thanks reshared my terminal, um, which actually showed this is from from one of the hosts I just spun up. Um, so the you know the variant is is Kate's, but there isn't you know there's a an ID and a name which is just Bottle Rocket. So if you do this on something like uh, here, let me exit out of here. See so I'm on an Ubuntu image, which says I'm a Ubuntu and I'm like Debian. So in this case, Bottle Rocket is a essentially a top level uh, Linux distro. Uh, so I, I actually don't know what the build tools. I know CoreOS was based on build pipelines for Gentoo, uh, but I know a lot of the Bottle Rocket stuff it, is doing it themselves. So there's a lot of infrastructure behind the scenes for things like secure image uh, signing and um, and how like it's configured. All that stuff is. is it's, a lot of it's in Rust. Uh, it's, yes. It just kind of makes you know an extra layer of security for memory hardening. Hardening. Uh, so I I don't know the actual build tool and, pipeline for it. And it's also all statically compiled, so that you don't have to include. You know, there's there's virtually zero linkages uh, from the binary to you know other libraries and things like that. So that that also helps alleviate the need to worry about. Uh, what the underlying operating system is. And, and funny thing about static linking, it's good for security aspects. And, and some people will think that it's just like, well, why didn't we always static link everything? Like, why do we have all these shared libraries? And and that usually comes down to memory management and, and file management. So it's, I can install a new library and everyone autom automatically gets that benefits. But also at runtime, all everything that depends on, say, glibc uh, can share the one glibc library in memory as Linux will you know, hey, I already have that memory. Everyone points to the one I have. Whereas if you're statically compiled, you are going to copy that memory over and over again. And so you yep. will have a little bit more memory usage on the entire system because of static linking, which is, again, it's good and bad. It's trade-offs of, you know, security and deterministic execution versus, you know, lower memory footprints and, you know, some flexibility of updating one thing and getting everything. So if, if one tool wants a new version of something, you're gonna have to. You can statically compile it, and and you can. You don't have to share those versions. But if you want all of the tools to get a security update from a under, you know underlying library, you do have to recompile them all. So there are trade offs still. Yep, definitely. Okay, so um, let me go. Let me switch back. Do, do, do. I. I... I always love for the silence just to see who's going to talk first, and then usually I'll make a face when when no one speaks for a period of time. Well, I was I was thinking like what Justin said about the memory, um, you know, uh, being duplicated and everything, and I was I was remembering back to there being a service that can come along and dedupe pages of memory uh, in the kernel, and that being standard. But then uh, I don't think that's something that would exist on Bottle Rocket in the first place. So and, I was about to mention it, and then I thought better of it. And that's actually great for things like uh, hypervisors, right? You have a right. bunch of hosts that are spun up over and over again. It's just, it does. There's no shared files between those different, you know, KVM instances or Zen instances or whatever. Uh, but at the kernel level, I can just say, "Hey, this page looks like that page," and I'm just going to like stick it over here and then you know save memory. And so that is great at that hypervisor layer. A lot of times, containers don't have that sort same you know shared duplicate over and over again because you might be running you know different runtimes or different you know completely different applications so it is much more varied it's it's not as like when vms run linux the first you know 30% is is the linux kernel with whatever standard services you're running so exactly so we have a couple more questions uh M M U E Steve uh, wants to know about gpu support um is there support for GPUs, Elastic Inference, Inferentia, or in Bottle Rocket? Not today. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think you know that's something that we could definitely put on our roadmap for uh, down the future. And then also, what's the Elastic Inference adapter uh, adapter thing that you can attach? So I think you could potentially like write something that could that could make API calls out to that. Um, rather than having to have a GPU directly on board. Uh, so that might be something that you you could potentially adapt without having to, to have GPU support. So 
maybe explore down that road if it, if it would work for you. All right. Bottle Let's rocket update. But it's again, all open source. It's on GitHub, bottle rocket OS, bottle rocket update operator. Uh, so this is, uh, if, if you tuned in when we talked about controllers, like what is, uh, AWS controllers for Kubernetes, the ACK, it's 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 this little guy, uh, my little, um, it, it, I actually wrote a note on, this is the, my bottle rocket update operator. And, and whenever I say, I, I'm gonna flip this switch, it's gonna flip it back for me and say, no, this is what your state should be. Uh, this, an operator is a controller with a little more smarts in how it should do things. It's, it's taken literally from the term of like ops, an ops person, someone that actually has knowledge on how the system should be put together, uh, which again, CoreOS kind of uh, did a lot of that stuff early days in Kubernetes. And, and this is a way that you can you know, take a controller and add some more to it. Instead of just like always trying and failing, we need to like coordinate some of this stuff. And this is exactly what we have to do with this operator. So uh, getting started here tells you some of the things that we're gonna set up real quick. Uh, one of them is, you know, we have an actual operator, which is is our controller um, that does the stuff we want, coordinates the information between between instances. Um, we have a, a deployment that you know creates that operator and image. We have an aim, agent daemon set, which will run on all the instances. So this is going to actually schedule a container that will run on each instance in our cluster. Uh, we'll make a namespace so that we can just query the stuff easily and keep it separate from other namespaces, uh, as well as you know some other things we want, like a service accounts and credentials, that kind of stuff. Um, so I'm going to go ahead. I already have this cloned locally. Uh, I'm going to apply this. I'm trying to think if I should switch back. I'll switch back to the terminal, and I can show. I can copy paste the commands from there, Let's show you one by one. Um, so. Oops, if I can spell it right. Uh, so you see, I, this is basically what I have. This is a very clean EKS cluster. Uh, this is my my repo of the operator. So I'm going to take this, actually here, I'll, I'll show it real fast. Uh, it's gonna do a bunch of stuff. Each, each little section here is we're gonna make a namespace. Uh, we're going to set up some RBAC rules on what we can do in that namespace. Uh, we have a cluster role binding um, for you know added RBAC, more RBAC, more RBAC. Here's my service accounts. Um, so it's just a lot of stuff that we're going to do. Here we go. Here's our deployment. And this is this is going to actually create the controller uh, container. Um, so this is how much we want one of them and, and just general information. It's, it's pretty standard if you're used to a Kubernetes deployment of any sense um, and then what it's going to do. And then I think further down, we're going to see our daemon set here. Um, so this is the actual agent that's going to run on the instances themselves. Um, so we can apply that. It's like magic with Kubernetes. Everything just prints out and it's all running automatically, right? So um, <laughs> we can already see we have our bottle rocket namespace and... It's all. Let's see what's there. Um, and this is, you know, creating our deployments. And actually, our, we got one replica set. Nothing's ready yet. Um, and then daemon set getting ready to, to land. But nothing, right now, nothing's desired, nothing's current. And so uh, if I switch back, there's one thing we actually have to do to the instances to tell them, hey, operator, look over here. I want you to do something. I want you to maintain me. I want you to do updates for me. Um, and the thing we actually have to do is we have to apply this label. Um, oh, that was not at all the keyboard shortcut that I wanted. Um, so, oops. I, I control shift copied in the browser, which opens up uh, debug tools, and it always, it always kills me. So this is basically the label we want to apply to our instances that tell it, hey, operator, I update me, because this is a label that we apply, a Kubernetes label specifically that we apply to the to the instances. And there's there's one thing here that actually we don't want version one. Uh, we're going to want version two, because uh, it's, it's GA now. And so the difference is version one would run the agent container and actually use updog to do the updates. Uh, updog is the, no one's going to say it. No. What? It's what's the up update. Dog? What, what's up, dog? Is the is the joke? Uh, I, I knew you're. Uh, Adam was. He was like, no, I'm not you doing didn't it see that. I didn't see that coming. I, I almost like, had Brett. He almost did it. Okay, I should. Uh, I should have let go. Uh, I was. 
I was literally yeah. thinking, what is the purpose of up dog and about to answer that, not yeah. what's up dog. Oh yeah. man. So what's up dog uh, is the joke, but also the CLI tool that you use to update your uh, instances. And so if I, um, let me SSH into one of those instances again. Uh, man, it's, it's Monday. That's my only excuse. Uh, I'm just going to look at it real fast oh, you know, for a Monday. The sub command check update. So this, I'm again, I'm on five. Why did it say no image update? Also, the beauty of I say this every time. The beauty of doing it live. We're going to see Justin work through this <laughs> in real time. So, uh, and and hidden hidden joke uh, that shout out to. Um, Samuel Carp for for telling me this one. If you look in the updog code, there actually is a hidden uh, subcommand here um, for what's. Um, so you actually get it. It does the check command, but what's updog uh, or updog what's uh, is <laughs> is the same thing. Which I I just love that it's a hidden feature. It doesn't actually print out in your help here, which is, um, but it'll do the same thing here. That's funny. So I am not sure why it's doing this right now, but we're still going to roll with uh, what I thought I was going to do. Um, I think Factory. I'm going to build a leaderboard for all of our demos. And anytime a demo has like any issue, you're going to just get, you're going to get added to the leaderboard. I think <laughs> Jesse Butler is in the lead right now. <laughs> I don't know if he is. I just, I just I wanted to so. say that. Yeah, I, I definitely think so. Uh, so while you're working on that, let's explain what Updog does um, because Texan Raj was just asking that. So Updog is a process that can, there's two partitions uh, in Bottle Rocket OS. One is active, one is standby. And so what happens when Updog runs is it checks for updates and it downloads the entire operating system update that exists and writes it off to the standby partition. And then it flips the bootloader to on next boot, boot from that, uh, that other partition. So it's like a blue green deploy type situation. Um, and the operating system update is shipped as an entire uh, artifact, just like you know all the things that we love about using containers, uh, packaging the entire thing together. There's no yum update or up, you know, partially updating uh, your update your operating system, and that sort of thing. So you definitely uh, updog is is uh, pretty cool in that regard. And this isn't, you know, Jesse would, would tell us this isn't the first time this has, uh, been a thing, you know, it's been around for a while, but it's definitely a great design pattern to follow, especially when you're used to dealing in terms of, you know, I shipped this code and it ran on that operating system. Now that operating system can actually have an actual definition. You know, you don't have to track all that. You can just track the operating system release itself. So, and Wari wants to know, do you have to reboot the node after the update? Yes. However, um, one of the cool things, I don't know if you know this, but like when you do reboot inside an operating system in an EC2 instance, you don't always, uh, I think it depends on the type of reboot, but you don't always hand back the VM. So you can do like the reboot itself is actually a little bit faster and you keep the same instance ID. So yes, you reboot, but it could actually happen faster. I, I'm actually a little curious. I don't know if anyone from Bottle Rocket is on. I have Slack closed right now, but I'm wondering if the update server has published the 1.0 yet because it literally, this landed like a couple hours ago. Uh, so I don't know, even though the AMIs were cut, I'm not 100% positive the update server is publishing those yet. So we're going to just keep going forward and, and hopefully this works. But cool. uh, I, I was going to explain what we're going to do here is we're basically going to get all of our instances, all of our you know, Kubernetes nodes uh, from this, and we're going to apply a Kubernetes label the node with that label that we just said. So we want the 2.0 label on all of the instances. Um, we have deployed the update operator. So once I apply this label, the operator is going to look at them and say, oh, cool, I have things I can do because it's basically looking for nodes that have this label on them to actually do work. Um, yeah. So 
And I think you're answering Sathya's question here, trying to understand what do you update the label slash annotation, then you run updog and the operator is going to be what handles running updog for you. And it's going to do it in a controlled manner. It's going to, like if you have three nodes, it's going to start with one node and it's going to roll through and do like a, a very organized update of your nodes. So, and that's actually, so we have this status going right now and that's actually the demo that I had um, just to kind of explain visually what's going on here. So I'm actually going to switch this down to my awesome. desktop. Um, here's my, here's my, my operator here. But the way that I thought of it was I, I like this Tupperware uh, notion of, uh, there we go. Um, the OS is this Tupperware, and, Tupperware, and here's my my partition between my disk, right? This is oh, nice. partition A, partition B, and so what I'm actually doing here is uh, taking these these. This is this is the GA of uh, Cheerio, <laughs> and so this is this is partition A, and so what the operator is going to do is it's actually looking at the instance and and saying, oh well, you need golden grams are are the golden uh, image here. So so this definitely is definitely an upgrade. So right. <laughs> Are those plain Cheerios or plain, honey? I know it's, it was a beta, so it's, okay, it's okay. Yes. So this is essentially like like we, the, here's where we're at. When the updater is going to run updog or we do it through the API, we're going to write this to disk and then we reboot to the golden gram side. Um, and so the, the thing that's important here with these labels is in your cluster, you have multiple, right? So you have you have a bunch of instances with version, you know, the beta version or, or the Cheerio version of <laughs> and so yes. what we're actually doing here is the operator is going to label these one by one. Um, if you can show my screen again real fast, yep. you can actually see those labels as they're getting applied. And so we have um, this is, you know, see these are saying update available false, uh, which is not what's supposed to be happening right now. Uh, it actually will when the update server gets the AMI and sees that it's available, this turns to true. And then it basically uses Kubernetes labels on the instances. So it uses etcd behind the covers, but it uses these labels to say when it's doing work. Um, it'll actually say, oh, okay, well, we're going to go through and we're going to, you know, we need to stabilize, um, which is we just all want to kind of come to the same moment. And then this uh, action state is going to say if it's doing an update, if it's going through a reboot, what it's doing um, in the cluster. And so we're using these labels. And I actually, I, I didn't even hear it was, uh, hmm. I didn't make my, my actual label of, we can see like like which one's ready at a time. And so we, we use Kubernetes to kind of change this label and move it from one to the other as we go through these upgrade cycles. So you know this was the one that went first. We did an update. We rebooted. And, and we go back to a ready state. So if we're doing work, um, it only, in, and again, the operator. Uh-oh, I think we lost Justin. We did. His did audio anyway. Point. Now we just have a view of Cheerios and no context. Oh, we need some milk at least. <laughs> Maybe he went to go get milk and he's gonna do some other. Yeah, here. I think he, well, I don't see anything moving either. I feel like he would be moving. Do you think maybe he froze? <laughs> Roll him back. <laughs> That's great. That's yeah, great. Got it. Points to Mew Steve on that one. Here he comes. My, All right. My Ethernet just hard just crashed on that. I don't know what happened. I, so I'm wireless now, but uh, you know, we'll see how this goes. Um, so yeah, so basically we get these labels. I don't know where I cut out. So we have we have labels that are, are used as instance labels. And so we have a rebooting, you know, when after my update's done, once I'm ready, I come here. And then so like my next instance is gonna say, hey, I need an update too, based on these Kubernetes labels. And, and we're gonna do our update. We're gonna pour our golden grams and and go through the whole cycle again. Hey Justin, so I you I think you're kind of answering this, but what is the the logic of the workflow of how it applies updates across all the nodes in the cluster? It, I don't think there's, there's no order that's specific. It just finds everything. And the first one that the operator sees says, hey, I'm going to pick one and update it. And so, but it only lets one go at a time. So that's, uh, so that's, that's critical because if we didn't have the operator actually understanding the cluster layouts, it could just say, hey, all three of you do updates and reboot. 
right? Which is, which is a bad day <laughs> for any operator of the cluster. And then all of a yeah. sudden, hey, everything's down because 1.0 came out. So it's like, that's that's maybe not good. So we do need this coordination to say, I only want one to go at a time. Uh, and I do know there's, there's core OS had a way to do it with um, uh, locksmith D, uh, which was their kind of lock tool that used etcd behind the covers. And you could say like, you could give it downtime windows and say, hey, I only want this to happen on a you know Saturday nights, and I want you to do five instances at a time. If you have a big cluster, doing one at a time might take a, a really long time, right? I mean, like you might have to go back to the store and buy some more golden grams, and it's corn. It, you know, it's it's a pandemic right now, so all they have is Fruit Loops, and you're like, well, I don't know if I want the Fruit Loop one, but um, this analogy is falling apart. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> so so I'm there just are. Wait and see how how far you can take it. <laughs> there are there are things that you're going to want to do with this operator, and and this is where some of the like benefit the pros and cons come into play of doing things this way is cutting an AMI and rolling that out through your cluster uh, is is sometimes more management burden. With an operator, I can slowly roll this out throughout the cluster, and things just magically happen for me. However. Some things are out of sync. If I, if my auto scaling group scales up, what's going to happen? You're going to get new, uh, yeah. already updated. I'm, I'm going to get not already updated because my AMI is still the old AMI, right? Like if I don't update my old AMI, I'm going to sit here with Cheerios all day. And if I don't apply the correct labels, the operator's not going to see it. So this oh. is going to join the cluster. And all of a sudden it's like, oh, hey, like I need you to do some, actually, I need to turn off that green screen because that's that's bugging me. I don't know about anyone else. Um, hold on a second, none, boom. Um, this new you know, instance is gonna join. We need to keep my, what actual, because in, in these, all these instances still look like, to AWS, they still look like the old AMI. There's nothing about these True. that has updated. So if I query my instances and say, hey, what AMI are you? I'm the five, you know, zero five and oh, my other node got labels and I thought it was coming through with updates, but it didn't. Uh, so it, it says, I'm, you know, I'm the old AMI. So if I query, I'm like, oh, everything's, you know, 0 0.5, but actually these have already been updated and rebooted. And so I need a different interface to be able to look at that. And that's actually really cool for things like if you're using Kubernetes labels for this, uh, things like uh, ACK, the AWS controllers for Kubernetes kind of makes sense because my interface is Kubernetes and I can actually manage an ASG through Kubernetes. So I could have things like the operator or some out of band controller say, hey, I'm gonna query all these instances for what they're actually running, not what's on the partition, but what's running, and then stick that over to Kubernetes. Once my cluster has stabilized, once those labels are all okay, then I can say, okay, now my ASG should be the new AMI. And so when I get a new instance, I'm not gonna get Cheerios. Automatically, my next instance that come in is gonna have golden graphs. And, and I don't need to go through the update process again. I can just, okay, scale up, we're good. And so only the existing nodes had to actually go through the reboot process, um, which is super handy, but you do need to have some of that syncing available depending on how you're doing you know, your your infrastructure management as immutable and what it's, you know, where you're controlling that state. At an OS layer, we can do it. Talking to Kubernetes, we can do it with labels. Uh, but you do need something that coordinates that ASG. And so, uh, oh, go ahead, Adam. Well, I, I okay. I was just going to so to clarify, it's, I'm basically, the controller is helping me with those in-place updates, right? Those in-place uh, uh, operating system upgrades. But I still need to have a mechanism to control the auto-scaling groups because obviously those are pointing to an old AMI. So it's kind of two ways I need to navigate this, this update process. Is that fair to say? Yeah, and it, it depends on, again, you know, the operator right now doesn't d touch the ASG. So the, the auto scaling group is just gonna still always give me Cheerios whenever I scale up. Uh, and then as soon as I get it, if I get labels on it, the update operators say, hey, you need to reboot again. And so it's it's two times to you know get in a state of I'm ready, uh, which isn't good. And so we that needs to be improved. Uh, but at the same time, if you're using things like um, maybe ECS or some other uh, orchestrator that doesn't coordinate through Kubernetes labels, if it, it does have more ties into AWS, like maybe that can be handled for you. I don't, there's actually no answer for that right now, but this was something that I thought of as, as, as an operator, you know, historical operator of like, what would happen yeah. when I scale up? Like that's a problem. Uh, and so be aware of how that works and, and where you actually want that immutability. 
Um, and the, to your point, Brent, of like, why would I ever reboot these instances? Like, what's why do why don't I just throw them away and mm -hmm. get a new instance every time? Because that's what we've been taught over and over again with this immutable infrastructure. Is like, well, you know, a lot of people will change their launch template and say, give me the new AMI, so every new instance is automatically get the new one, and then I'm just going to cycle out and, and slowly, you know, those old ones will go away. Uh, but that doesn't work at huge scales, right? If I have a thousand instances, I can't just necessarily like easily go through and get a thousand more instances. Like that's going to take a lot of time to like provision them and create them. Reboots are a lot faster because you're going to keep the same instance ID. Uh, all that stuff is going to be a lot faster as long as you coordinate it properly to drain work and, and get my reboot to happen. Reboot fa happens faster than provision. So uh, that does make sense if, if you want to go that way and coordinate at a OS layer and an interface to say, hey, once I stabilize on an inst on an AMI ID, then we're going to switch all new instances to get it. But for the time being, if I have a thousand, I need to swap out the instance. Rebooting is going to be quite a bit faster. That's awesome. So it's it seems like we do have two different mechanisms at play that we could use to update our operating system with with EKS. So limiting the context to EKS, we have. Uh, manage node groups that can manage the rollout of your new AMI, or if you're using Bottle Rocket, you can what's up dog and you know have new operating system running without having to swap out the AMI. Um, those two, it, it's fair to say, it sounds like from what you've just described, those two things aren't coordinated yet, but it's very likely that they will be sometime in the future. And um, what's Go ahead. Yeah, it's not. I mean, it's definitely something that can happen, right? Uh, like, yeah. it, whether you're using something like ACK or you know, you could have another container or the controller can do it to call out to, you know, find my launch template. Okay, hey, we're stabilized. Let's update that AMI so new instances get it. Uh, the actual other way to manage your instances is instead of running the operator, you could just like this is you know, here's one ASG. Instead of changing the launch template, create a new ASG. Yep. This has the AMI, and then your immutable infrastructure isn't at the partition level. It's not at the uh, single ASG, but it's actually at, I can roll back from one ASG to another. And so I can slowly, again, you have to provision new instances. It new might take a little groups. while. Uh, and so at you know really large scale, let's say we have a thousand again, if I'm doing a, this is a blue green swap from ASG to ASG. So a blue green swap was 1000 to another thousand. That's gonna cost me a lot of money. So what you probably want to do is do something like a rolling, you know, release of ASGs where you create the two ASGs. You say, hey, I actually, you know, this is my new ASG. So we're going to add, you know, a couple here. Okay, now we can take the old one away and then we can switch everything. We'll slowly, you know, get to the old ASG being zero and my new ASG is taken over. So we can do that similar to a Kubernetes deployment where we say we want a rolling release, not a blue green deploy, which will double your infrastructure and then cut over. At this point, hey, we can slowly roll this out. And then if we have a problem with a new ASG, we haven't, we don't necessarily need to get rid of this one yet. So we can just, hey, there's a problem. We started seeing errors, scale this to zero and, and go back to the old ASG. And, right. and that can scale up just like however we're doing our scale ups with either you know metrics or whatever it is. Right. That's awesome. There's a it's it's great to have choices. So um, I love that. And I love, I still think that if I was going to build it, I would probably uh, experiment like updog and, and partition swapping and, and keeping the same AMIs and same uh, VMs would be my starting point. And I would see, can I make that work? And uh, then, you know, if, if I started running into those issues you were talking about with updating the, the you know, scaling out the auto scale group and having uh, an older AMI, that's when I would start to figure out, okay, what, what can I do to work around that? Yeah, and, and that way, initially just, I'm, I'm switching back to green screen. Um, that way is the least work, right? Like you have an operator that does that for you, but again, if, if you can handle, if you don't scale up often, you're fine because your instances, you get updates and you don't need to worry about it. If you scale up frequently uh, and you actually need to control some of those, you know, IDs and, and how things are, are being added to the system, especially if you need to scale up fast. If I, you know, if I need to scale up within a minute, but also I need to do an update, that's not going to work. And so you need to take that into consideration of your workloads and your environment and how 
you're going to do those updates. But for sure, for smaller things, um, at least right, right now with the operator, we can do this at the OS layer with just some Kubernetes labels to do that locking and not worry about my cluster is gone. Um, those things work really well. And so that's where I would definitely have people play with it and see where they like that immutability. Right. That's awesome. I don't know if I have time to show off ECS. Um, yeah, I do feel like that'd be a good feature request. I, I've just been thinking about that, like so to auto update your I, I didn't finish my, like, I actually have like a bash I, script that I started, which basically does that for me. So it looks at, it, it pulls Kubernetes and says, hey, once we get to stabilize, uh, then, you know, it, or sorry, once we get all the nodes back to ready and, and we can we can pull what, version they are and everything else, then I can look up that AMI ID and then stick it in my launch template. And so I can do those things. So it's not a blue green ASG swap, it is a launch template update. So that new scaling is going to get the newer AMI without this. And also I have, um, uh, let me get back to my terminal. Um, again, it, the updates aren't, I don't think are, are available yet. So we're, we're not going to actually see it happen. Um, but if I... Model Rocket 2. Um, in, inside of EKS control, there is a configuration that you can actually automatically label your, your instances when they come up. So I can say, hey, once you come up, you're automatically going to get this 2.0 label. So I can say once it's in there, the operator will see it and start you know, managing it. It's managing the OS lifecycle. But I do need to take consideration that this would cause a reboot for any new instances that come into my cluster uh, are, are probably going to reboot if they're old, if I'm using an old AMI. So I would need to, at some point, update this AMI ID or update the one that's ideally the one in the launch template. So, okay, question. In like the next few minutes, can we see this in ECS? Is that possible? I think we can run through it. Um, let me find where that is. Because ECS, let's switch. Actually, here, wait, I'm, I'm going to stay on the terminal because we're just going to go with it. Um, someone else can throw the link for it. And oh, did Chrome just crash? No, Chrome didn't crash. Um, throw the link. Here, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it here in this chat, um, but I'm, I don't have I don't have uh, uh, Twitch open, so. Okay, got you. That's why we're here. Yep. So let's let's run through it with ECS. So basically, ADOS command where create a cluster, uh, US West two, create a cluster, name a bottle rocket. There's no instances. There's no nothing in here. It's just a plain cluster. Uh, <clears throat> finding our AMI ID. This is, again, I'm just copy and pasting from this quick start, um, which is pretty straightforward if you want to test it out. So we're going to get a parameter, which is this path in SSM that says find the AWS EC1 uh, instance ID and give me the latest image ID. And so we're just going to output that, which we will want to save here. So that's the, the latest AWS ECS1, uh, which at this point is, is the, the developer preview. My, uh, we need to actually like verify our VPC, so our default VPC ID in my cluster, or in my in my account. Sorry, um, it's a lot of stuff here for. That's my VPC ID, and I need an IAM role for um, SSM to be able to manage it, or or to be able to connect to it through SSM. So this is, oops. I need that instance role ID or instance role name. Where'd that go? And so right now we're just grabbing all the prerequisites. Right. To we just deploy have this some information to create this cluster in my account. So we, we do need to know, you know, VPCs are unique per cluster and all that kind of stuff or per account. So, yeah. And yeah, so this is. In preview for ECS, it's GA for EKS. So. Oh, I did not create. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. We're going to get to this. I think we can do it. I bet we can do it. While we're doing it, uh, MUE Steve says, now you guys just need to do a session on Firecracker too. That would be interesting. I'll... Uh, I'll like put it. it on our backlog. We'll see what we can come up with. And so. while we're waiting, like seriously, uh, when it comes to show topics, oftentimes uh, you folks, you know, tell us what you want to hear about, and we will 
actually take that and put it into a show. So please, if there's other topics you want to learn about, you want to hear us talk about, um, let us know. In fact, tomorrow's show, while we're waiting, uh, is actually one of the ideas uh, from someone in the audience. I forget who, forgive me, but uh, we're going to look at custom VPC networking for your EKS cluster uh, because someone was asking about IP exhaustion and uh, they wanted to find out, you know, how could they mitigate that in their in their VPC. And so we're just going to do that. We're going to build it and kind of show you uh, some of the tactics that you can take. And we're going to have like awesome big VPC ranges that or IP ranges that you can use for your pods. Very good. Very I made, good. I made a user data uh, script that says uh, when you boot, I want you to join my uh, bottle rocket cluster, which is the one I created. Um, Let's go into this. Um, I have a SSH key, which is called Bottle Rocket. Uh, my subnet ID and image ID. And the other thing I needed, I have user data. And I need a instance profile name. So we have not. Yeah, but. This question, Sathya is asking, have y'all done app mesh on EC2? We totally could. I didn't, like, is that is that something you want to see? Uh, tell me, is that, like, is that a thing for you? And if so, uh, we'll definitely do it. I just didn't realize that uh, container workloads running on EC2, I assume you mean unorchestrated, uh, yeah. Okay. Let's do that. So I'll add that cool. to my, I'll add that to the backlog now. He's doing it live. <laughs> I, I need to get my, I'm, I'm still creating this role, but I didn't get my subnets, uh, subnet ID. Yeah, subnet ID, image ID. Describe subnets. There it is. So I need that VPC ID here. And then we paste this one in, get my subnet ID. If, I don't know if anyone knows, uh, you can open your current command in, a, in your editor, uh, which is super handy for these multi-line things. Um, so I have a keyboard shortcut. I'm in, VI key mapping. So I hit escape V, which just literally opens Vim uh, with my current command, which is super handy. Um, if anyone. Is, we should, we no joke. We should spend an hour on a show of just you and all your cool shortcuts <laughs> and all the like, you know, cause you got to, you do a lot of really cool things there is like this. There is a bash built in way to do that, but I can't remember what it is, but it'll open your last command in. Oh, F FC is typically a built-in yes. that will open FC, your last. That's it. Thank yeah. you. And that's literally like, so there's, yeah, there's FC for your last command. And then there's uh, open my current command in a shell or in a, my editor. Um, so let's, I need my submit ID. Do I still have this in the background? I do. Sweet. Uh, what was my image ID? Uh, latest. Of course, I didn't copy and paste those when I should have because they just scrolled off the screen. So that back. And what else am I waiting for? My Just my role now. OK, let me go back into the browser. And I don't think it's, this says anywhere creating that. I was looking to see if there's something that let me do that. And I got an EC2. So I'm going to add some permissions. I'm going to add access to um, ECS uh, as a as a role or as a as permission so that I can say, hey, this this instance can talk to ECS. And then I also want to give it uh, SSM core, uh, which allows me to, allows the SSM agent to talk to the SSM endpoints uh, to be able to, me to connect to it and for it to be managed through session ma or systems manager. Um, ECS. I hope I made enough of the 
uh, permissions. I, I skim through this documentation just right now. So let's see. And it's, and it's a demo. You can always yep. go, go blanket <laughs> access. Yep. Don't want to say the word, but true. Um, admin. Okay. So now I have my, my, my SSH key, my subnet, my, the AMI ID, um, the region I'm in. And I already created this user data, which is just telling it which cluster to connect to and some permissions to actually do the thing. So write that out. Did you fail? Oh, seriously? And I have it nowhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Oh. oh. Well, like, wait, doing it that way. isn't it even up? Like, could you up arrow to get it back? No. Oh, you know why? Because that wasn't, that command was actually like five commands ago. Because I yeah. was suspending it and coming back. Right, yeah. Um, here, let's just, let's just do it again. Now I, now I know most of that information. <laughs> Again, so uh, just uh, the counter is two doing it lives uh, <laughs> for you today, Justin. So sweet. This is my image ID, submit ID. Where'd that command go? Oh, here's two A. And just for context, uh, again, just while we're sitting here waiting, we're just we're we we got to do this all in, in EKS. Uh, really cool. And now Justin's just showing us the, it was a beta or what do we call developer preview? Developer so if, preview. If you're yeah. a developer, you might want to check this out. If you're not a developer, please don't run this in prod. <laughs> yes. There you go. I'm sure we're, we're checking on ECS right now. So we're just getting a chance to see what bottle rocket looks like in an ECS cluster. Uh, and, and really like it, it should be very uneventful. Uh, right. You should have a, a functional ECS cluster. Uh, I'm going to switch over to the browser again. Yeah, it's true. It really, like, it, it's not like there's like a, a fireworks show here. It's just right. It'll it's, work. It's a Linux instance that connects to ECS. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if containers. you can share that back. I know yep. we're over, but I think you said we have a little bit of. Yeah, we're we're, room we're, here. we're good. Sorry. We have some wiggle room. Please connect. Let's see. I got nothing active. Let's, it might just be because it, it does take a little bit. Let's see. Oh, hello. <laughs> Selman says hello. The dogs are excited. They're like, yeah, we're going to get it. So clearly Brent's dog likes ECS. That's right. And hates bugs. Uh, <laughs> I can relate. Is this... I don't even know if this is correct. Yeah, here's ECS bottle rocket. So I have uh, this was good. I think this one takes the cake. That that's got a win for today for sure. Yeah. <laughs> What's up, guys, Doug? I like that. Very good, Rex Roof. Thank you for that. Totally. So, I mean, I don't know. It's up. It's up to you how you no. feel this is going, Justin. But we can always. No. I got an instance that started. It says it's running, uh, but my cluster, let's see if it actually joined. I don't think it did. Oh, look, there it is. Yes. Success. Get it. <laughs> it has an outdated ECS agent. <laughs> Not surprised at that, but you know, that's totally Those agents correctable. Update frequently. But yes, we do have the instance ID did connect into ECS. And so uh, again, this is, ECS instead of EKS, the operator doesn't work here because the operator uses Kubernetes labels. Uh, but there are other things we can do as a fully managed container orchestrator in ECS to help make this easier. So developer preview, if you want to get started and try it out, for sure, like give feedback. The project open source, open an issue. Uh, developers that actually are working at Bottle Rocket are, are there frequently and uh, exchanging a lot of great ideas. So you can for sure, you know, get involved and, and tell us what you want. Tell us where you want to run it and how, what your constraints are and, and that sort of stuff. It'd be great to hear. That's awesome. And that was such a great demo. We got tons of feedback already. Uh, 
if you're out there and you think this is a great demo and you want to share it with the rest of your team, uh, definitely do that. Hopefully it can help explain to them, you know, what are you eating your containers? <laughs> <laughs> this is the OS. There's no containers here. This is version one. Okay. Well, you really, there's no actual rust there. I was about to say, ah, I was about to say that. <laughs> ah, <I win. laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Sorry, Brett. No, I do need some milk. Though. This bottle rocket would be a lot better with milk. <laughs> well, are you eating the Cheerios or the Golden Grams? Both. Oh. All right. I would do like a sandwich. I would do the the, the Golden Grams on the outside with the Cheerios. I will say, version one, these Golden Grams are a lot better. So. Yeah. Yes, 100%. <laughs> Definitely an upgrade. All right. Uh, sound off in the chat. Uh, let us know on Twitter. Uh, follow us. Send us. We're going to start posting stuff to LinkedIn. We're trying to find you. So if you think this is a great format, you want to uh, share it with your team, let us know what's working best for you. Um, and we love uh, we love producing these videos. I think Justin has been amazing today. So thank you for joining us, Justin. Yeah. Uh, if you check out our YouTube page, you, you can see the upcoming schedule for the rest of the week. To see what our topics are, you can subscribe there and get push notifications there as well. Um, so we're trying to make this easy for you, and hopefully it's it's working out. Hopefully every day you learn a little something. I know I do. So uh, thank you uh, for joining. Yes. Thanks, everybody. We will see you tomorrow. <laughs>